Um, g'day, I'm Daniel. Welcome to the New Ideas for Any Angle Pathfinding. Um, so I guess before we begin, or maybe the place we should start is a little bit about me. Um, so it won't surprise you to learn that I'm from Australia. Um, I'm from a Monash University, and so my research focus there is pathfinding. Um, I think about pathfinding in all manner of contexts. Single agent search, multi-agent search, usually I model these problems on grids or navigation meshes. Often I solve them under constraints. So the constraints can be on the agents themselves, or they could be on the search. So sometimes we need to find a path with limited computational resources. Um, if you're interested to know more about uh, the kind of work that I do, please visit my homepage. Okay, so let's dive right in. Let's, let's talk about some pathfinding. Um, and the particular problem that I want to talk to you about today is called any angle pathfinding. So this is a problem where we are given a discretized representation, a map of some environment. And the map contains traversable areas and non-traversable areas, and we're given a pairs of points, start and target locations. And our job is to find a minimum cost path from the start to the target. But what differentiates any angle pathfinding from, say, grid-based pathfinding is that the path we're looking for is not just any path. It's a Euclidean optimal path. So what that means is that the path shouldn't be artificially constrained by the discretization choices that we've made to represent the environment. So let me make that really clear. Here's a grid-based optimal path. We're not looking for paths like this. We're looking for paths like this. So here you can see that this path can essentially enter and exit any grid tile at any angle, or go any angle pathfinding. Okay, so I've given you the setup. Let me give you some more details. Um, I'm gonna make a couple of simplifying assumptions. So the problems that I'm going to be discussing are um, involving single size agents, point agents if you like, and I'm going to be talking about two types of terrains. I assume that there's only traversable terrain and non-traversable terrain. Um, also, we should understand what success looks like when we discuss these problems and algorithms for solving them. So I've listed here uh, some desirable algorithmic properties um, that our methods should have if they're good any angle pathfinding techniques. So the paths that they return should be short. That means no detours, no really long looking path when there's a much more straightforward route available. The paths should also be smooth, so no unnecessary turns like we saw with the grid-based paths there. Um, the paths should be computed fast. Now fast is relative. When I talk about fast, I'm usually talking about timings on the order of milliseconds, on, of microseconds rather than milliseconds. And I'd like to be able to solve these problems online. So that means that we can apply the same method um, for static worlds and also for dynamic environments. So that means no large pre-computes. Okay, so the talk is new ideas for any angle pathfinding, but, but what I want to do is start with some established ideas for any angle pathfinding. Um, and I'm going to critique two popular ideas. Um, so I want to say up front that these are good ideas, right? They're, they're, they're popular, they're time tested, and more important, they work. But I think it's important also to be able to criticize established ideas so that we can understand how well they work, where they don't work, and why we might try to do better. So the first established idea I want to talk about is called string pulling. It's a very old idea. Um, it's about 20 years old, almost. It appeared in Game Developer Magazine back in, 20, back in 2011, and it's due to Marco Pinta. So the idea is basically we run grid A star, or something equivalent on our discretized representation, and then we take the path that's returned and we try to smooth it. So let's have an example. Here's the grid path. And these points are these undesirable turns that I was just talking about a moment ago. And so if you can imagine a post-processing technique where we grab the ends of the path and we pull it taut. And after this post-processing technique, we get this lovely looking path which also happens to be Euclidean optimal. Hooray! The problem with string pulling is the following. So sometimes the string gets pulled the wrong way around an obstacle. What I mean by the wrong way around an obstacle, it's a bit vague. So here, in bold, is a grid optimal path, right? And if we try to pull this taut, we see that, well, it's already taut, right? If we try to make it any shorter, it'll intersect the obstacle. Here's the problem. In purple, also in bold, is another grid optimal path. It has exactly the same cost 
as the one I just showed you. But this one, we can pull taut. So in this sense, grid optimal search has, has basically made an arbitrary choice, right? It, it selected one path over the other, and it bent the wrong way around an obstacle. We pulled the path the wrong way around. Okay, so that's string pooling. Um, and an immediate improvement on string pooling appears at AAAI in 2007 from Alex Nash um, and a group of friends of his at the, University, at the University of Southern California. So this is an immediate improvement on string pooling. It's a really cool and very influential idea. It's called Theta Star. And so the idea is basically this. Look, string pooling is nice, but why don't we interleave string pulling and search at the same time? And maybe we can do better. So what I thought I'd do is show you a simulation of how Theta Star searches. But I'm not going to show you the entire search because it's too big. So what I'll do is I'll just show you some selected node expansions. So in the beginning, Theta Star expands the starting node. And it basically follows grid moves. So it moves straight and it moves diagonally to reach neighbors. OK, so far so good just like grid-based search. Now, Theta Star will eventually expand this node here. And it will follow the grid edges, and it will generate a successor, as you see. Now things get interesting. So when Theta Star generates a successor, it performs a visibility test. It says, can this successor see the parent of the currently expanded node, right? Can it see its grandparent? And if that visibility test is true, then Theta Star pulls the string and makes the grandparent the parent of the newly generated node. And so here's another node that Theta Star eventually expands, and it does the string pulling thing again, and again, and again. I'm not going to go all the way to the target. So here's the, here's the path that Theta Star finds on this trivial example. Again, it found the grid optimal path. But there's a couple of problems with Theta Star. Um, and so the first problem is these online visibility checks, right? Every time we generate a node, we're testing visibility. So now we're introducing a whole bunch of additional overhead into grid A star that we didn't have before. So this can slow down pathfinding search. And usually, um, implementations of that star tend to run a little bit slower than grid A star, but they have much better paths. The second problem is that data star is just like string pulling. Um, is suboptimal in general. And so what I thought I'd do is try and give you a bit of an intuition about what is happening here and why does it fail to find the optimal path? Because it looks like it's making the right moves. And so here is the path that Theta Star eventually returns. It's Euclidean optimal, so that's nice. But even though it finds the best path, it, it finds it in the wrong way. And so here what I've shown you in orange highlighted in bold, is how Theta Star reaches each of these nodes that eventually lead to the target state. And what I've also shown is their F values. So in Pathfinding Search, the F value is the priority of a node, right? How promising is this node? And so one of the, um, one of the, one of the properties of A star is that F values should never be decreasing along an optimal path. But you can see here that before A star reaches the target, it expands a predecessor with an F value of 3.82, and then the target, 3.65. It's gone down, right? If we cannot maintain this monotonically increasing uh, F values, we can't guarantee optimal solutions. And the problem is this, all right? Because theta star is only propagating information along grid edges, it actually fails to expand a node. It fails to expand this blue node that I've highlighted here, right? This is never in the theta star search space. And it has the right F value. If theta star had have expanded this first, then everything would have been fine. And so this motivation here leads me to introduce you to some new ideas for any angle pathfinding. Um, the first method that I want to talk about is called Anya, and it's an any-angle pathfinding technique specifically designed for grids. Um, in the second part, I'll talk about a related technique that works on navigation meshes. So the reason I think Anya is exciting is so for years, people were doing any-angle pathfinding and always suboptimally. Um, Anya is the first algorithm that's fast, it's optimal, and it's online, right? So we solved the problem without any pre-processing, um, and we solve it much, much faster than previous online methods. So how does it work? Um, the key intuition is rather than expanding nodes 
from the grid one at a time. We consider intervals, contiguous intervals from the grid, sets of nodes together at one time. And so here I'm looking for intervals around the start state. And so two really good places to look for intervals is to the left of the start state along the current row and to the right of the start state. And we get these two lovely intervals here. Another good place to look for intervals is in the row adjacent to the start node, okay? So we can scan the row above, and we can scan the row below, and we extend this interval as far as we can until we hit an obstacle or some corner point. Okay, so intervals, we get other intervals, they're propagated from one row to another. I'm just showing you here how it works, and then I'll explain a little bit more about why it works. And so we continue like this until something interesting happens. So here, what I've highlighted in this, I don't know if you can see it so well, this uh, green area is all of, the, all of the area that's visible from the starting node, okay? And what's interesting is that there are successes, right? There is an interval, this blue section of the interval that's reachable, but that's not visible from the starting state. So to reach any of these nodes, we have to turn at this blue node that I've marked here, okay? And so as long as we remember that, then we can propagate the blue interval. So we can push it onto the next row of the grid and we can continue until eventually we expand an interval that has the target. And then we're done. Okay, so that was very broad strokes. Um, in terms of technical detail, the first thing that Anya does different, right? So at a high level, it's just running a star search. But what differs is how it defines the model of the search. And the first thing that differs is the search nodes. So in, in Theta star, in grid-based Theta star, nodes are just locations. In Anya, a node is a combination of a location and an interval, okay? So the location corresponds to the last turning point on the path, and the interval corresponds all of the points that the path would possibly go through in order to reach um, a successor state. So what about successes? Okay, so how do successes work in this weird node representation? So here's a node, okay? The root of this node, um, the last turning point is shown down the bottom and the interval, the associated interval is this thing that I've marked in green. All right. And so what we do is we simply push the interval, we project it onto the next row of the grid, okay? And so basically, I've just extended, it's like shining a flashlight, right? I'm just extending the beam of light onto the next row, and I have intervals constructed from all of the points that I can see. So these are called observable intervals. But, you know, we saw before that there's points where you have to turn. And we also generate these non-observable intervals, okay? So we generate a non-observable interval whenever the current interval has a corner point inside it. And so here, the current interval D1 to D4 has a corner point at um, C1 to C4, I should say, has a, has a corner point at C4, okay? And so from here, we can actually generate more successes. But for each one of these successes, we have to remember that we need to turn at R prime, okay? And so we can generate intervals on the next row, or we can push the path along the row where the corner point was. And the final piece of the puzzle is the evaluation function. So A star has these F values that we saw just a moment ago. How do we compute F values when we're reasoning about sets of points, Daniel? It's an infinite number of points in the interval. All right, so here's a target, a potential target. So the way that we're going to compute an F value for this, okay, is we take the distance to the root node, okay? So here the path has been decided, plus we need an estimate from the root to the target. And so if it happens that we can cast a ray to the target and it goes through the interval, then it's very easy to identify the point inside the interval that minimizes the distance to the target. And we simply take that distance as the estimate. If the target is off to the side, then it's also very easy. We can just take the corner endpoint of the interval as the point that minimizes the distance to the target. Okay, and always we have a lower bound. Okay, that's, that's the point here. We, we, we want lower bounds, we want admissible lower bounds. Okay, here's a more tricky situation. So in the previous two examples, the target was always above the interval, but here the target is below the interval. And if I just make a straight line to the target, I'm not going through the interval. So I'm breaking admissibility here. <laughs> um, but it, this is also very easy. And what we can do is we can just mirror 
the target through the row of the current interval. And we get this alternative target, okay? And the distance to this alternative target is exactly the same as its mirrored counterpart, right? So now it just breaks down into one of the other cases that we just discussed. So that's it. You've got all the pieces for Anya, okay? Um, quick couple of words about the theoretical properties. I'm, I'm not gonna get into any theory here. Um, it's complete. So complete means that if there exists a path in the space, Anya is guaranteed to find it. Um, it's optimal, okay? So what that means is that because we have these, these admissible F values and because we eventually guarantee to reach every point on the grid, we will eventually expand a node that has the target and when we do, that node is guaranteed to be the optimal path, okay? Um, and it's entirely online, right? I've done no pre-processing. All the reasoning we're doing on the fly. Um, if you want more details, there's a, there's a 2016 journal paper that we wrote about this um, and I recommend you to that. So let's look at some results. So this is a kind of complicated graph. I cribbed it directly from said journal paper. So let me try and unpack it a little bit. Um, the black line that you see here is Anya. And what we're interested in is making comparisons with existing any angle techniques. And there's two classes of techniques. All of these are apples to oranges because there is no other algorithm that has all the same properties as Anya. Um, so what we're measuring is how fast all of these algorithms go relative to grid A star. Okay, so speed up. Higher is better. And on the y-axis, we have a log scale. On the x-axis, we order all of the problem instances that we're solving basically by node expansions performed by grid A star. So the more node expansions, the harder we consider a problem. So the further to the right, the harder the problem. All right. So here's a, a set of maps from Baldur's Gate 2. And so down the bottom, is a bunch of algorithms, um, variations on string pulling, right? Theta star and friends. And so you can see that these algorithms are struggling to just keep up with grid A star, right? And I mentioned this to you before because of all the constant visibility checks. Anya, meanwhile, is going 10, 20, sometimes 30 times faster. There's this interesting red line here. Uh, there's this algorithm called subTL. So this is a pre-processing based algorithm, right? This is doing intensive pre-computes. It generates a whole bunch of data that it then exploits during search. Um, it's, it's a really cool idea, but if the map changes, all of your pre-computed information is now obsolete, right? So this is one advantage that Anya has that SubTL does not. Um, and you know, it's still sometimes competitive. Um, here's a different benchmark. These are maps drawn from Dragon Age Origins. By the way, all of these maps are due to Nathan Sturtevant um, and the Moving AI repository, if you're interested in looking at these problems yourself. So here, again, we see Anya performs very well, order of magnitude improvement versus grid A star, but now it's also keeping up with sub-TL. These are hard instances, even for sub-TL, right? And Anya is able to do better here, even though it's online. <laughs> no pre-processing. Um, here's, here's a benchmark on StarCraft, right? And actually, this time, Anya has a small advantage for some of the very hard problems, okay? Um, so that's Anya. Now, I promised you I'd talk about navigation meshes. So what we did a few years after we developed Anya, we generalized it um, to develop a new algorithm, a new any angle pathfinding technique that's not grid specific. And we call it PolyAnya, poly for polygons. Um, and so the idea is very similar, right? We keep all of the same machinery that Anya has, but we need to be a little bit more careful about how we propagate intervals because there's no longer any rows of the grid. We just have polygons. So here's Polyanya expanding the start state. So it's looking, right? First it needs to identify inside which polygon is the starting state and the target state, and we can do this efficiently. And then it basically says, well, I can see every edge. So every edge becomes a complete interval, okay? And it's going to propagate those edges. And by propagating the edges, what I mean is exactly like Anya, right? It's going to push them. But instead of pushing from row grid to row grid, it's pushing across the face of an adjacent polygon. So here, Polyanya is pushing onto, onto this obstacle, and it identifies an interval there. Here's Polyanya pushing the diagonal interval across the face of the adjacent polygon, and it derives this new interval. Okay, so all of these nodes have the same root point, right, the starting state. Um, there's also non-observable successes, just like Anya, okay? So we have this corner point here, 
that I've marked in blue, and I've shown the partial path, right? So this is the path, like you have to go from the starting point to this point, and then through some intervals. So here are the non-observable intervals of the starting state. Okay, so we've got one, two, three intervals across the face of the adjacent polygon. All right, so the next node that Anya may expand is probably this one, okay? Um, and so again, we push across the face of the next adjacent polygon, and we derive three new observable successes. And again, there's a corner point inside the interval that we've just pushed. And so now we also need to account for these non-observable successes, right? So the points that we can reach by turning at the yellow corner point. And so here they are. So we have here four non-observable successes, okay? So probably the next point, the, the next node that the search will expand will be this one. So we're, we're moving towards the target, right? And we push into the target polygon across the face and we generate intervals along the other side, okay? But we also detect, oh hey, we've jumped over the target. So we also generate the target as a successor. And of course, we're done. As soon as we pop the target off the A star open list. Um, but we can do better, right? So this is already very good, right? You saw that it was just a small number of expansions in order to solve the problem. Um, but so have a look at these nodes that I've highlighted here, these intervals rather. So these intervals are not very interesting, right? We've generated them. We've, we've wasted time putting them on the open list, sorting them. But when we pop them off, we can't push into an obstacle, right? There's no successes there. So actually, we can detect these when we generate them, and we can immediately just throw them away. All right, so now here's the nodes that we've had to add to the open list, all right? So this is what's caused us to do work, real work. But then there's these nodes. So these, these nodes are kind of interesting again. So these are intervals that push into polygons that have only an entrance and no exit, right? To come out, you gotta go back the way in. So there's no point going in unless the target's in the polygon. So we can throw these away because these nodes are just dead ends, okay? Um, and finally, we can do another thing, right? So there is, there is this other optimization that we call intermediate pruning. And so here, basically what we do is a recursive technique similar to jump point search where we say, look, if a node has only a single successor, then we might as well just expand it immediately and avoid putting it on the open list and then later taking it off the open list. So here, the interval that pushes into the target polygon is now an intermediate because we've pruned away, right, everything that was on the other side of the polygon. There's no point putting this thing on the open list. We might as well just immediately expand it and generate the starting state, which is its only successor. So we've avoided a push operation on the open list and a pop operation from the open list. All right, so what's left? These are the nodes that actually consist our open list, right? Very, very small number of nodes. Um, so before I get to some results, let me just quickly talk about mesh selection, right? So um, the meshes that you saw um, in the previous example were made up by me, by hand. Um, what we did was we took the moving AI instances and we tried to generate different meshes from them. Now you can, we use the tool called Fade2D, it's a commercial tool. Um, it's, it's, I believe, free for academic use. Um, you can use your favorite nav mesh tool, for example, Recast, right, to generate your meshes. It doesn't matter. So here are three examples of meshes that we generated. So um, figure B, which appears on my right, maybe your, yeah, your right, top, top, top right. Um, so here we just tried to build the biggest rectangles that we possibly could, okay? And we did this greedily. Um, figure C is a constrained Delaunay triangulation that we computed with fade 2 d And this comes directly out of uh, that particular tool. And then figure D in the bottom right is the result of trying to merge those triangles together to get bigger, rect uh, to get bigger polygons, okay? So the main takeaway here, the main lesson that we learned from trying out these different mesh types is that bigger meshes, right, bigger polygons, lead to faster search. So searching on something like the original grid is not very worthwhile. But if you can generate these lovely big polygons, particularly if 
as is the case for these merged triangulations, if, if, if they can be big and they have low branching factor, so there's not too many neighbors, um, the search performs remarkably well. And so the results I'll show you are using these merged constrained Delaunay triangulation meshes. All right, so now these are exactly the same benchmarks and exactly the same experiments that I showed you in the previous section. But now we have a new competitor, polyanya in green. So again, let me just remind you the y-axis is speed up versus a star, and it's a log scale. And the x-axis is the relative difficulty of the problem instances as measured by the number of a star node expansions. Okay? Um, so what we see on this Baldur's Gate map, uh, on this set of maps um, from uh, Baldur's Gate 2, is that polyanya can be several times faster than anya, right? So we've got these lovely big rectangles. Um, these lovely big polygons, and they allow us in a single operation to jump a very big distance, whereas Anya would have had to go row by row by row by row by row. Okay, so that's, that's why we see a nice improvement here. Um, here's Dragon Age. So this is a challenging problem for everyone. Um, here, so Anya was already similar performance to SubTL, which is the pre-processing based variant um, that I told you was very, very fast. And Polyanya is able to keep up with this algorithm. Again, it's running entirely online, right? There's no pre-processing here. If your world is dynamically changing, that's fine. It's very cheap to repair your mesh. If you drop a building onto, a, onto, onto, onto the mesh, you just split the polygon, and that's a local operation. Similarly, if you have to delete something from the mesh and something that was blocked becomes traversable. Um, SubTL has to do complete pre-computation, <laughs> complete re-computation. Um, here's StarCraft, and now the advantage versus SubTL is magnified, right? So we've gone from being 10, 20, 30 times faster with Anya than Grid A Star in some cases, to Poly Anya being up to 100 times faster than Grid A Star. So um, let me just wrap up. Um, so I guess the, the first thing that I want to say, um, if you're not doing any angle pathfinding, um, or if you haven't looked into this area in a while, it's come a long way in the last few years. Performance has increased dramatically, as I hope I've convinced you. We're making fewer trade-offs than we used to be, right? We're no longer having to choose between optimality on the one hand and performance on the other hand and static worlds versus dynamic worlds, right? We can have our cake and eat it too, effectively. Um, and so we're solving a broader range of problems. <laughs> on the other hand, there's more work that's needed, right? So um, what I've told you about is still a fairly simpli a simplified problem, right? There's only two terrain types and we're considering point agents. Kinematic constraints, vehicles, turning arcs, they're still hard. Computing optimal paths with kinematic constraints is still incredibly challenging. Um, weighted terrains remain challenging, right? Here we had only traversable and non-traversable terrain, but if you have you know, units that can walk on water or maybe they have different movement costs, these problems are very hard to solve optimally very, very fast. We don't have equivalent algorithms yet that can do this kind of uh, problem solving. 3D pathfinding, a flying AI, so um, maybe some of the lessons that we're learning with Anya and Polyanya could be fruitfully applied to these areas, right? So um, maybe instead of reasoning about intervals, which are one-dimensional constructs, maybe we can reason in a 3D space, we can reason about planes, right? And maybe projecting planes across polytopes. Um, but it's not clear yet how to do that, how well it works, or if it works. Um, so if you're interested in this, and I hope I've maybe made you a little bit interested, um, if you'd like to um, check out some of the papers or even play with experimental source code, I stress experimental source code, um, check out my homepage. You'll find links there to my Bitbucket repository. Um, thank you for being a lovely audience.